Okay, so <clears throat> as we uh, are looking at the material from the book, uh, tonight we're in chapter 4, which is entitled Divine Design. Just as a, a reminder, the goal here is for us to have the ability to reason with people and give a, an answer for the hope that is within us. And this is uh, really all of us, uh, the goal of this is handling the things that you would run into before the Bible. Before somebody has agreed that God wrote the word, before somebody is at that point of understanding that there is a God uh, and that the scriptures are divinely inspired, how do you get them to that point? And the answer is, is you use the techniques of reasoning and you uh, use the things that God has laid out for us to use. Uh, and in the case tonight, as well as some of the material we've covered previously, the scriptures tell us it is perfectly appropriate to point people towards his creation to prove his existence, right? So you don't need a Bible to know there's a God. You do need to know, have a Bible to know Jesus is God, which is a pretty important distinction. But if somebody is not yet aware of, uh, or has not decided yet whether th they should believe in God, you can simply do what Isaiah says. Lift up your eyes on high and see who has created these stars, the one who leads forth their host by number. He calls them all by name because of the greatness of his might and the strength of his power. Not one of them is missing. Isaiah, as many of the prophets and many of the Psalms do, says, look up. You want to understand whether there's a God or not? Just look up. Look at the sky, look at the stars. Uh, I, I think, actually, one of the problems that we have today is that we, it's a little bit more difficult to appreciate the beauty of the stars because we live in cities with lights, and you don't get to see. I mean, that picture I have up there is not a picture that you would see in the middle of Louisville. Right? There's just too much light pollution uh, in order for you to get that level of visibility. You might get that out in Montana or something like that or uh, parts of Alaska and, uh, where you're away from civilization, but it's hard to do in the city. But we know that that's, that's still there and we can point people towards it. And uh, one of the things that I think is by design with God is for all intents and purposes, when you look to the heavens and you look out at the stars and we look as far as we can, how far out does the universe go from all practical purposes for us? Anybody know where the end is? It's endless, right? Because we don't know where the end is. If there is an end, we have found it. And there is something about looking at the infinite that reminds us of the infinite one. And so God in his, his wisdom uh, has designed the cosmos in such a way that we would look out at it. Um, along those lines, uh, if you look at Psalm 19, in fact, turn in your Bible to Psalm 19 and, and uh, read there with me. Look at how David uh, writes, I'm talking of the heavens and the sun in the sky. Psalm 19 he says, the heavens are telling of the glory of God, and their expanse is declaring the work of his hands. It's interesting, just the uh, very first verse says they have a sermon to preach, right? The heavens are declaring uh, the work of his hands. Uh, they're telling of his glory. That's, that's a sermon. Uh, day to day pours forth speech, and night to night reveals knowledge. It's a sermon that never stops. It's always there. It's always available. But then he says, there is no speech, nor are there words. Their voice is not heard. Their line has gone out through all, out all of the earth and their utterances to the end of the world. Now, the stars and the heavens and the sun, they have a message, but it's not a message with words. It's with their very existence. And, and then he says in verse 4, in them he has placed a tent for the sun which is as a bridegroom coming out of his chamber. It rejoices as a strong man to run his course. It's rising as from one end of the heavens and its circuit to the other end of them. And there is nothing hidden from its heat. So here you start out and he talks about the expanse of the heavens to start with, which would include all of the stars and everything in the, the starry night sky. But then he says, think about the sun. So now let's move to the daytime. Well, that 
thing in the sky, it, it moves on a circuit. And God has set a tent for it, meaning it, it has a habitation. It has a, a specific location for it to dwell and exist. And you and I can imagine, what if God did not have a tent for the sun, meaning he'd not set boundaries for it? And some days it gets really, you know, within five miles of us, and others it's 5,000 light years away. You can imagine the problems that we would have if God had not set the boundaries for the sun like that and had not set the circuit in the sky. Uh, from our vantage point, it's a, it's a circuit. And, um, and then he says there's nothing hidden from its heat. Uh, here you have the sun, and we understand exactly how powerful that is. We, we know it mathematically. I'm not sure that we understand it uh, emotionally, but academically we can understand that you have the, the temperature of the sun is hotter than anything here on earth, and it's, uh, it's like nuclear bombs going off every second and just immensely powerful. Uh, and, and so we can say, wow, look at, look at how powerful that is. But then you look at the expanse of the sky and you look out at the, the starry night sky and we start to look at stars and what do we find stars have in common with our sun? It's the same thing. Except our sun's not even like the big one. <laughs> right? Turns out our sun is, is nothing in comparison to other stars, even just within our galaxy. You start to look at stars like Arcturus and Betelgeuse and things like that, and they are just massive in comparison to our sun. So it's not the hottest, it's not the biggest, and yet we see how powerful it is. If In no other way we understand how powerful it is in that we can imagine what would happen to the earth if it's snuffed out. Right? Tomorrow you wake up and there is no sunrise. That circuit just stops. How quickly does everything demise here? So the, the psalmists talk about it, uh, the prophets talk about it, and just simply this idea of the heavens declare God's glory. And in that idea is also, in Psalm 19 in particular, this idea of God set the boundaries for these things in such a way that life will happen, right? If the sun doesn't have its particular circuit in the sky, we have a very big problem. If God doesn't set the boundaries for it the way he ought to, if God doesn't set the boundaries for the tides, remember in the book of Job where God asked Job, uh, who set the boundary for the sea, for the ocean, so that it goes here and no further? The answer to that, as, as the answer is to every question that God asked Job in, uh, in that section of, of the book is, I did. God did it. And imagine there wasn't. Imagine the tides could come in as far as they wanted to, whenever they wanted to. So those boundaries are a very big deal. And when you talk about those boundaries, what you're talking about is the idea of a designer. The world is a very complex place, gloriously complex. And so their logic goes like this. Every design had a designer. The universe has highly complex design to it. And that's what we'll talk about is a lot of that complex design. So therefore, if the universe has complex design and every design has a designer, then the universe has a designer. And so you end up back at talking about God. If you talk about, that's why sometimes you'll hear the term intelligent design as a, as a, um, a study of uh, how the world is designed in an intelligent way in such a way that there had to be a creator. Uh, if there is no creator, you would expect the opposite of complex fine-tuning. You would expect total chaos. Um, there was a Christian I know that was a demolitions expert in the military for a lot of years. And what we're covering is very detailed versions of what he summed up in one sentence. He said, Scott, I've blown up a lot of stuff. Never made nothing. And that really is what it comes down to. If, if this is just a big cosmic accident, you don't see a finely tuned environment. So what we're, we're going to be talking about is this idea of a, a finely tuned environment. 
This book, maybe you've heard of it. In fact, raise your hand if, if you've heard of the, the term the blind watchmaker before or the book. Raise your hand. Okay, so we've got a, we've got a few. So Richard Dawkins is probably the most uh, famous atheist in modern society. He's a wretched man. Um, and I mean that truly because Paul says, who will save me from this body of death, wretched man that I am? And the answer to that is Jesus. If you don't have Jesus, you're a wretched man. And this man does not have Jesus. And he is a very outspoken atheist. To tell you how kind of busted my head is, I, he's one of the few people I follow on Twitter. Um, just because I want to know what he's saying. Uh, and he is most, uh, he's written a lot of books. And I'm not even, I'll tell you, I'm not really saying go and buy them, but you should know about them. The most famous of all of them, though, is this book, The Blind Watchmaker. And it gets its title from the fact that uh, what he's trying to explain is why the universe seems so well organized and designed like a watch. Because if you look at the insides of a watch, there's all of those cogs and springs and gears and and every ratio is just dialed in exactly right so that a second is a second all the time. And, uh, and you see all of that design and you look at the inside of a watch and you assume somebody made it. And that's a fair assumption to make that, to see that level of detail and say, that was made, that was designed. It's far too complex to happen accidentally. Well, his whole job was to try and describe how I know the universe looks like a watch, but it really wasn't designed. In fact, I think the subtitle for the book is Why the Evidence of Evolution Reveals a Universe Without Design. It does not reveal that, but that's the book he's famous for. And so that's, uh, I, I point that out because here is, in any anytime you're dealing with uh, arguments against the truth, find where they put their most truths. Find where they put all their effort and you will have found their weakest point because that's what you do in a battle, right? You find your weak point and that's where you send all your troops to guard that. Well, Dawkins understood better than most that the biggest problem that an atheist has in trying to prove that there is no God is that everything seems to scream creator, designer, thought, imagination, detail, fine-tuning. And so that's where he put all of his effort was to try and prove otherwise. The, the reason he's put that energy there is because he understands that's, that's the weak point. That's where they really have a problem. Uh, and uh, one way to... Uh, to look at that is, here's a, a quote. Uh, the laws of science as we know them at present contain many fundamental numbers, like the size of the electric charge of the electron and the ratio of the masses of the proton and the electron. So we're talking about numbers and details at an atomic level, right? The remarkable fact is that the values of these numbers seem to have been very finely adjusted to make possible the development of life. That sounds like a quote from this book. Fine-tuning, detail, all that sort of thing. It's not from this book. That's Stephen Hawking. Stephen Hawking said that. And it's, a, it's been a giant problem for atheists. Is that the more that they look at the world, the more design they see, the more organized it becomes. Think about it for a second. When, uh, when Darwin first came up with his theory of evolution, Darwin believed that the cell, the just you know, a single red blood cell or a cell of a human body, or an animal's body for that matter, or a plant, was a very rudimentary building block, like a Lego. He thought it's just. It's just really simple, and so what we did is we took all these little simple things and made something more complex. But really, if you break it down, it's just a bunch of little Lego blocks. That's what uh, Darwin expected. 
because they didn't have the science at that point to really know what was going on at the cellular level. So his assumption was, is if we start looking down at that cellular level, we're going to find that it's not very complex at the, at the cell level. That was his hypothesis. Any of you who've studied any biology, cellular things, complex or not, immensely complex. There are factories in there. DNA alone is unbelievable, the amount of information. You could fit all of the information and knowledge that man has ever created in one drop of DNA. That's how complex DNA is. And that's not a whole cell. That's just the stuff in the guts in the middle of the cell, which is not a technical way of putting that. Um, so what they have as a problem is that, that particular idea. Um, okay, so here's the illustration I want you to think of for what we're going to talk about, which is the anthrop anthropic constants, which you do not need to remember that term. It's just a fancy term that gets, I get to say, and it makes me feel smart. Um, anthropic constant just simply means, constant means it doesn't change. So it's, it's a rule that doesn't change, like the speed of light doesn't change. Speed of light changes, you have a problem. Anthropic refers to life or humanity. Think of like the study of anthropology. That's the study of man, right? So what sort of constant things, what things need to not change in order for people to exist? That's all an anthropic constant is. So what I want you to do is I want you to imagine in mind's eye, you walk into a studio like this. And there's all of these sliders and dials, all of these buttons, and they're all set at different levels. So you go in, and if you're like me, you stand there for about 30 seconds before you get fidgety and you decide you want to touch something. So I go in and, I, and you move one of the dials, just, just one little notch, and up on the screen comes a skull and crossbones. And a big blaring alarm. So immediately you put that dial back. And then it goes back away. Okay, that's fine. Then you go to move another dial. Fix it. Go back. That's what the universe is like. There are some specific constant rules in the universe that have to be, and you move them even a little tiny bit, and life is gone. And they're all independent of each other, but also affect each other. Meaning, the speed of light. The speed of light is something that is a specific speed, which when I was in School, I could remember off the top of my head. Anybody remember off the top of your head what the speed of light is? Because I've totally forgotten that. What? One hundred eighty-six thousand uh, miles per second. Thank you. That. That's why I forgot it. Um, that speed is set. It doesn't change. But why is it that? Have you ever thought about that? Like, why is the speed of light the speed of light? There's nothing that forces the speed of light to be that speed. It's just dialed in on the board at that speed. And there's a lot of things that are that way, where it didn't have to be that way. You could change it, but it's dialed in on the board just exactly that way. And it turns out if it wasn't dialed in on the board at exactly that way, we're all dead. That's what anthropic constants are, is dealing with that idea of what are those things that uh, are designed to keep you alive? So in the book, uh, they talk about Apollo 13. So Tom Hanks goes up in a space shuttle. Okay, you're listening, good. Um, he goes up in a space shuttle, and if you know the story of Apollo 13, some things begin to go wrong, and they're... And they have, uh, uh, it turns out that the oxygen tank that ends up exploding, it exploded because somebody at some point dropped it two inches in the assembly phase. Two inches. That's what led to Apollo 13. 
So a very minor thing turns out to be a very major thing. And we understand that because space is a very harsh place to live, right? So you have these astronauts up there, and they're up there in space, and we have to protect them in a, this very specifically designed habitat. And if you look at that space shuttle, nobody says this happened by accident. Right? Nobody, to use another analogy, uh, uh, one of the uh, statistical ways of describing the chances that life would just happen is like uh, a tornado coming through a, a uh, junkyard and building a fully functional 747. Does anybody imagine when they look at a space shuttle that a tornado came through a junkyard and made that thing? Oh, no. you go, no, that's definitely designed, right? And it needs to be designed in order to survive in space. Well, guess what? We are doing the same thing. If you look, this is um, a picture that was taken when we had a satellite, and it, uh, um, I think satellite's the wrong term, but it was, a, it was a ship that was sent with cameras, and they turned it around at the edge of the Milky Way. At the edge of the Milky Way, they turned it around and pointed it at Earth, and that's Earth right there. Carl Sagan called it the pale blue dot. Another guy said, it, uh, it reminds us that we are but a moat suspended in a sunbeam, I think was the poetic way that they put it. We're on a space shuttle. Right? You're in space right now, right? All of us are. Hurtling around in space at high speeds, and yet you're alive because the space shuttle you're on is the Earth. But it is in a harsh environment, isn't it? So all of these things, what we, what we can do is we can begin to point out to people, I'm trying to give you different analogies you can use because as you're talking with somebody, really, we, the Earth has the same problems that Apollo 13 had. Everything has to work just right in order for it to work. Does anybody have any questions or comments or anything like that? I've done a lot of talking which I like doing, but sorry. Okay, so uh, as we look at it, let's, we're, what we're going to do tonight is look at just 10 anthropic constants. That's the goal, just look at 10 of them. There are, depending on who's counting, as few as 36, as many as 122. So there is debate over this, exactly how many anthropic constants there are, the guys who like to debate that are very boring individuals, but they're really smart. So that's the number. It's somewhere between around 36 to 122. But I will say this, the number does seem to keep going up the more science we study. So the more scientists study stuff, the more they go, oh, there's another thing that we need to be exactly the way it is. It started out at there was only 10. The first guy who kind of thought about this stuff said, oh, there's 10, and as time has gone on, it just kind of has, has gone up more and more. Okay, first one we'll look at is just simply oxygen levels. Um, if you have too much oxygen in the universe, you spontaneously combust. Anybody take high school science and do that really cool smoldering match thing in a, in a bottle of oxygen? Anybody ever get to do that? That was one of the coolest things I ever did. Yeah? Okay, yeah, uh, yeah, see, you and I, we get along. I did that at the House of Kids, too. So at one point, uh, Cozy was, had been on oxygen, and they took her off oxygen, and we had all this extra oxygen tank, and Jenna was like, we're going to give that back to the people. I'm like, we ain't giving it back. We're doing fun stuff. Um, and so... Oh, man. So you, you actually made your own oxygen out of splitting it up. That, that's a true geek right there. That's right. <laughs> he totally nerded out. So if you take oxygen and you put it in a, in a container, and then you take a match, you light the match, and then you blow the match out, but it's still kind of, it's not, you haven't dunked it in water, but it's, it's, it's out. It's not going to light again. But you then put it back in a pure oxygen environment, poof, you got fire again. Because fire takes off with an oxygen-rich environment. If you've ever heard of spontaneous combustion, it actually does happen. It happens sometimes in, uh, um, farmers will run into it, where they stack hay, and they stack it too high and too deep, 
and then you'll get a fire that starts in the center of it. Um, if you had too much oxygen in the environment, that would happen everywhere all the time. So you'd just be walking along and you know, you'd just wave at your neighbor while they're out mowing their lawn and then they'd catch on fire. It would be unenjoyable. That's what it means to have too much oxygen in the environment. Now, we all understand what happens if you have too little, though, right? We all suffocate and die. Too much, we burn to death. Too little, we suffocate to death. You have to have it in a very narrow spectrum. So oxygen is an anthropic constant that has to exist and does exist on the Earth. And it's a, you think about it, it's a very precise thing that has to happen because it isn't, a, it isn't as simple as just saying... Well, you need oxygen. No, you need oxygen, but just at the right amount. Another one is atmospheric, atmospheric transparency, meaning you and I, we can go and we can look up and see stuff outside of our atmosphere. Because our atmosphere is transparent, you can see stuff on the other side of it. Other planets, we know, are not that way. You get on the planet, you look up, and you see that it's all dark, like somebody's got a tinted window. Well, the problem is, is if you have too much atmospheric transparency, then you get solar radiation, and we all get cancer, and we all die. And that's also if we didn't burn up first. So there's a lot of burning up. Um, you have too little, and we freeze to death. So atmospheric transparency has to be very precise. And not only does it have to be precise in the sense of the, the tinting of it, it has to be made out of the specific things. It has to have a certain amount of nitrogen, a certain amount of oxygen, a certain amount of carbon dioxide, a certain amount of ozone. Um, uh, so these things are a, are a really big, big deal. Uh, third one, moon-earth gravity interaction. Okay, so the moon, it, we've not always known this, but at some point we figured out, you know, the cycles of the moon affect what? What's the big thing the cycles of the moon affect? The tides, right? And we, it's very precise, so, so much so that you can get a tidal chart. And you can figure out the tides are going to come up this far, or they're going to go down that far. Uh, when I was a kid, I had a science teacher who charted that we were going to have the, the lowest tide in a decade on a certain day, and he plotted a whole field trip around it. We went out, and we went, and the tide was way, way out. Well, that was because of the precision of it. If you didn't have that precision, that poor science teacher, he books a field trip, and we all you know, go out and drown because the water's not low. Um, so it's very precise, but it's based off of the moon. If the moon was any closer to the Earth, you would have massive tides. They would go very, very high and very, very low, and so you would have tsunamis for breakfast, every single day. Too far, and there would be no climactic um, uh, stability because you wouldn't really have those tides, and those tides are a big part of how the weather patterns and everything work. They, they wash uh, nutrients around, all sorts of things that you need to have. You need to have tides in the ocean for the weather patterns that we have. So, uh, once again, a really, really big deal. Uh, another one, carbon dioxide levels. So carbon dioxide, if you have too much carbon dioxide, this is one that you've probably heard. They're really worried about too much CO2 in the atmosphere. What are they, what's the big concern? Too much CO2 in the atmosphere, and what happens? Heat. We get too hot, we all die. That part is true. They're absolutely right, and this is... By the way, if you don't believe in God, and you believe that we are a cosmic accident, then you absolutely have every reason to be afraid that, the, that mankind could mess the whole thing up. Because if we're an accident, we're fragile. And that's what they're worried about. The human beings are going to produce so much carbon dioxide that we're going to turn this massive green, uh, runaway greenhouse effect, because there is a point. There's an interesting point in the curve. It's, it's, kinda, it's, it's a tipping point with CO2, uh, where it gets so, such a large quantity that it then starts self-producing more and more and more, and then you 
burn again with the burning. Um, and so they're worried about that. What happens if we hit that critical point? Uh, anybody familiar with Bill Nye, the science guy? Yeah, I know. I used to love him, and then he, I know. And then he started talking to more than just small children. Um, and so, yeah, but Bill Nye, the science guy, has openly said that the number one concern of all humanity needs to be climate change. Now, if you have his atheistic worldview, I don't blame him. Because he thinks, human beings, we're going to wreck the whole thing. We're barely here. We're very fragile. And so it's all going to fall apart. Our worldview, though, is different than his. I don't believe that we're fragile. I don't believe the cosmos are fragile because I believe God made it. And when somebody makes something, you build redundancies in. You take care of those things. God's, God's made sure to watch over it. And what we've found is that, that that's the case. So too much, you have runaway greenhouse effect. If you have too little carbon dioxide, you get no photosynthesis. Photosynthesis, what does that matter for? Plants. So plants do photosynthesis. That's where they get their energy. And what do plants do? They make oxygen, so not enough CO2. Ironically, that means there's not enough oxygen and we suffocate. Burning, suffocating. It's just a horrible cycle. Um, okay, any questions, comments, or anything like that? Yes. Yes. Oh, yeah. So if, if we're having the conversation of can human beings affect the climate, I think that's a different conversation, right? And, and I, I think it's, it's fair for you to bring that up. Can we have an impact on the world around us? Well, yeah, we know we can. Uh, the Panama Canal exists because of us. And that's made a pretty massive change on things. Uh, there are definitely things that human beings can do to the climate. Can we tilt it so far that we all die? In the end of the world, I don't believe that. But yes, can we do some things where we're bad stewards of it and there's a problem? Absolutely would agree with that. Yep. Um, and uh, so that's a, that's a good distinction to make. I appreciate that. Um, any other comments or questions? Okay. Uh, gravity. Gravity is a force at a specific rate based off of mass and things like that. And if you altered the gravitational force dial, to use that analogy again, by one part in 10 to the 40th, we wouldn't survive. Okay, so 10 to the 40th is, you think of a number, you have a, 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 the decimal point, 40 zeros and a 1, 10 to the 40th. To give you an idea of how small of a tolerance that is, because that's what we're talking about at this point, is tolerances. How tight are the tolerances on gravitational force? Imagine you had a tape measure that covered as far as we have seen in the universe. Okay, so that's, that's the distance that we're covering. And then you looked at a one-inch tolerance on that chart, on that tape measure. That's the tolerance of 10 to the 40th power. It's so infinitesimally small. You alter that puppy just a little bit, and really bad stuff happens. Because gravitational force affects everything. It affects the rotation of planets. It affects uh, gravity, uh, uh, affects uh, even the, the fission process that's going on in the sun. So if, if gravitational force is off, then the sun isn't able to produce the heat that it does, and we die. So there's lots of different things that can occur there. Uh, next one, the universe expansion rate. This, so this one matches a little bit what we talked about with uh, last class with the, the galaxy seeds, where there's this rate at which the universe expands. And if it goes too fast, you can't have galaxies. If it goes too slow, everything actually collapses back into itself because there's too much mass and it's like a giant black hole. So they calculated this. Don't ask me how they calculated it because I don't know. 
But they, they said that if you do the math on it, and this is, by the way, the atheist calculations, I think it was actually Stephen Hawking who did the calculation on this one. One part in 1,000 millionth, million millionth rate, if you were to change it by one part in 1,000 million millionth in the first second of the Big Bang. And once again, I don't want you to be afraid of the term Big Bang because we're not talking about billions and billions of years. We're just talking about when God made the world, I'm guessing it was a Big Bang. We just know who banged it. But if you change that rate by 1,000 million millionth in the first second, nothing happens. Everything had to be exactly right in order for us to be here. Um, uh, speed of light, that's another one. Uh, all other physics can be described in terms of the speed of light. So you change uh, the speed of light and you change everything else. Uh, well, like one of the things we talked about before is you're talking about color, right? And color is a, it's a based off of a light spectrum and how it hits things. Change the speed of light, guess what? All the colors go wonky. Ha <laughs> ha, you're on my club now. I mean, it, it wouldn't take much, right? And that would be the least of your problems. So the speed of light... All physics, you can actually take things like mass and time and stuff and describe it in terms of the speed of light. Uh, and so it's, uh, it's kind of a big thing. Uh, anybody have any comments or questions? Anything like that? Okay. Um, the next one is the, the anthropic constant that is specific to us of what I call the Jupiter guard. Uh, so if you look at Jupiter, it's a really, really, really big planet. To kind of understand the size of Jupiter in respect to Earth, have you ever seen one of those gigantic gumball machines that's like a big globe, and then the gumballs are a little tiny in there, and then you put your quarter in, and it goes down the thing? Okay, Earth is the gumball. Jupiter is the big globe. That's, a, that's an easy way to kind of think of it scale-wise. Not a technical way. I think actually, technically speaking, you have to go even smaller than that. But it gives you an idea. So Jupiter is just a gigantic vacuum cleaner for comets and meteors and things of that nature because it's big, so it has a massive gravitational pull. Right? So the reason that you and I... When you jump up, you go down on the Earth is because the Earth is really, really big, and that mass pulls you back towards it. Uh, Jupiter's really, 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 really big, and so if stuff is flying through the cosmos, it'll hit Jupiter instead of hitting you. In fact, you can look on Jupiter, and if you see pictures of Jupiter, especially down in like the lower, like lower uh, quadrants, there are these what look like scars or pockmarks on Jupiter that you can see, those are left over from comets that have hit it that were bigger than Earth. The comet was bigger than Earth. So you can imagine if you didn't have Jupiter there and a comet the size of Earth hits Earth, I don't think we win that deal. Right? I, 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 I think that turns out badly for us. Um, I mean, I've watched enough apocalyptic movies to know how this works out. And so uh, you need that. You need a large planet in a similar circuit around uh, the same star in order to protect you. Otherwise, you die from stuff hitting you. Um, the Earth's rotational speed. So our Earth, it goes around the sun like this, but it also goes like this. right? And it goes all the way one circuit. How long? How long does it take to go one way? 24 hours, right. Every day, you go around 24 hours. You start thinking about the speed of that, you get dizzy. Um, if it's slower, we have problems, right? Because if, if uh, the rotational speed is too long, we, we get climactic instability, meaning it, it, that the climate, it takes too long you're either too cold for too long or too hot for too long, and there's major problems. Right? So you take, 
like this really hot weather that we're having, imagine it wasn't for 12 hours that you got the 90 degree heat. It's like six months with no night. That is awful. <laughs> so that's a problem. If it's too short, meaning it spins too fast, then you have atmospheric wind velocities that are a major problem. So imagine super hurricanes that go completely out of control if you travel too quickly that way. So all of these things, they kind of begin to come together as being a major, major issue. The last one uh, is atmospheric discharge rate, which is a cool, uh, fancy way of saying lightning. Your atmosphere that you are in has to discharge excess electricity, and the way that it does that is lightning. So <clears throat> if, if the discharge rate of lightning, which is something they measure, as they, they have ways of measuring how much lightning goes off in the world during any given period of time, and it's very consistent. It's weird. If, it's not, if lightning's not going off here, it's going off somewhere else. It's always happening. If that changes and, and it's higher, meaning you get more lightning, they have found that the math turns out to be a major problem for us. That if you get too much lightning, you actually start burning up the earth. And it doesn't seem like that to us because we've never had faced that, but it wouldn't take much of a change of that constant discharge rate to all of a sudden burn everything. That's all the burning. Um, and then the other one, though, is if it's too little. Imagine we just said, well, let's get rid of lightning then. We don't want any lightning. Lightning is required for something called nit nitrogen fixation. The nitrogen that is needed in the atmosphere and particularly in the soil. So if, like if you're a gardener or you're uh, a lawn nut, you probably have added nitrogen to your soil before. You, things need nitrogen in order to grow. Lightning makes that happen. It, puts, it breaks down nitrogen oxide in order that nitrogen can be back in the atmosphere. And so you need it if you don't have it. And, and not only does it do it for the soil, it also does it up in the troposphere in a way that uh, we need it there as well. So all of these things, once again, there's a lot more of these, but you don't need to know them all. All we need to know is, under, is that these are things that as scientists discover the wor world that we live in, more and more we find it's finely tuned. It's designed in a way that uh, God had to make it that way for us to understand. And so they've done the math on it, the statistical math. And the, the answer is the chances that any planet, so they, they took all the potential planets in the universe, and then they took all the anthropic constants that are required and the tolerances, and they said, okay, let's do the math on it the chances that even one planet in the universe would have uh, the, uh, the accidental happening of life is 10 to the 38th power. So that's one with 38 zeros in front of it. So here's your problem. The amount of atoms in the universe are 10 to the 20th power. So... A way to think about this and a way to describe it to somebody is, imagine you had a laser pointer. And the, the width of the laser on the laser pointer, you know, you're going to mess with your cat with the thing, right? The, the, the width of that is one atom wide. It's a super tiny, specific laser. And then you're going to take it and, and you get one chance. You only get one. And you're going to randomly point it in the cosmos at one atom, what are the chances that you get, and there's only one atom that's the right one, you're going to randomly point that laser pointer, what are the chances you hit the right atom? It's impossible, right? We, it's what we would call a statistical impossibility. That's what you're looking at. The idea that this happened by accident, that's not comparing it to a a watch. A watch is rudimentary in comparison. I mean, it's nothing in terms of complexity. We're not talking about a watch. We're, we're talking about uh, something, uh, 
at a level of complexity that statistically there's not enough atoms in the universe to equal the amount of chances it would take for it to just randomly happen. And so it, it's just a, the anthropic constants are a simple way uh, of describing in detail what most of us kind of already understand, right? Which is we live in a complex world. It doesn't make sense that this would happen by accident. Intuitively, you understand that. But what we want to be able to do is, unfortunately, we live in a world of indoctrination where people have been told not to pay attention to what we would assume is common sense. So we've got to go back to the math, go back to those things and explain it to people. Um, okay, so that's the, the, uh, the logic there. And um, anybody have any comments or questions before we close down? I know there's a lot of material that time. I don't always try and do that, but that's kind of where we're at tonight. Yes? Okay, that's a valid point. Yeah, Star Wars is also scientifically inaccurate. Killjoy. Um, yes. <laughs> yes. Yes. 